Somebody find out what that noise is back aft, if there's anything running back there. So I proceed through the boat, and I get back to the crew's washroom. Here's a guy sitting in there, reading the comic books, the old easy wash, chunk, 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 you know, and sound man going crazy up forward, no enemy around anywhere close, only the dirty shirts and the dirty socks in there. So uh, I raised a lot of hell with him and get everything straightened around, shut off the sound back aft that the sound man had. and. Uh, I wanted to get rid of that thing right then and there, but uh, I didn't have the authority to do it. So we transferred captains and we got the new captain on, and I took advantage of that. S give two motor machinist mates 15, 16 pound mauls and told him, make that fit through the escape hatch. And they did, they pounded it down in a little small ball and brought it up through the escape hatch and over the side it went, right with the coke machine. and everything else uh, that was, under some person's opinion, necessary, but they're not necessary to survive on a submarine. Though the effect of submarine warfare was devastating to the enemy, it was also extremely hazardous duty for the courageous crews of the silent service. We were uh, off of northern Honshu in our seventh war patrol off the coast right north of uh, Yokohama, a little town called Todosaki, I believe was our point. And we had the area north of the runner, the runner was south of us, we had all, each had a prescribed area that we stayed our, uh, restricting our activities to so we didn't shoot at each other. And we, we made an attack early one morning, we were very f far north, almost to the Arctic Circle, so we had very short nights, about four hour nights, and, and our charge was not full because we couldn't have the full six or eight hours we needed to charge the batteries off the diesel engine when we were on the surface at night. And so we, we didn't have a full charge and we dove early in the morning and we made a contact with a convoy of 21 ships and they were close to the coast, hugging the coast. And we came in from the, the seaward side and made our approach and fired four torpedoes from our forward tubes uh, and then, then went under the target. Our, our first time I ever heard of a, a skipper using that tactic to go under the target, assuming that the destroyer's escorts would be on the, looking for us on the other side where the torpedoes came from and we would be on the opposite side. Well, the way it worked out, the Japs outsmarted us. They were waiting for us on the other side. Before we could even come up and, and start firing with our stern tubes, they laid about six depth charges on us and drove us down to 365 feet. All the lights went out in a total darkness before in several minutes before the emergency lights came back on and we finally could see that we were six, 365 feet. Significance of that is our maximum test depth of 275 feet. And the pressure hull was, was imploding, you know, come, come, bending in like an oil can, boinging in, and, and we couldn't maneuver around because the stanchions were binding up, and uh, uh, of course all the, the glass broke, and, and uh, that day we went through a depth charging of 360 plus depth charge of us. Uh, I, I, we, we couldn't even count the bombs. We, we were jokingly sending with that a, a damn bomb factory over there in an airbase somewhere because they were just literally lo unloading them, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And uh, this went on all day long, and we were flooded. At, we were running at a 30 degree up angle, approximately, uh, which is pretty steep. And the after engine, after torpedo room was about half full of water. And it was extremely cold. The injectors were reading 32 degrees when we dove. Uh, and the after engine room had, had water up over part of the auxiliary engine, which is in the bottom of it. Pump room was flooded. The forward torpedo room was flooded almost to the watertight doors. Uh, and we suffered like that uh, until late that night. At dusk, it was about 11 something, I think, when the sun went down. And uh, we were out of high pressure air. Our batteries were almost fully discharged. The, the oxygen was so bad, you couldn't light a cigarette. You literally had to hold the match, the sulfur, to the cigarette and <laughs> suck on it all the time to keep the damn thing lit. And so finally, uh, uh, then a lot of other things that, that we, we, we figured we'd bought the farm and we'd had it. That was it. There was no, no way we could get out of this thing. Our high pressure air was, was low. Uh, our low pressure blowers were gone because the pump room was flooded and we couldn't flood. We couldn't, we couldn't move water from one tank to another because every time we would blast some air into it to move it or pump it, the Japs, we, we had, oh, I forgot the most important part, we had seven Jap destroyers making a circle around us like Indians around a wagon train and they would take turns running over us dropping depth charges all day long. Uh, and close ones, a depth charge, 
has two sounds to it. One, if it's far away, it just has a big boom, which is probably the, the, the loudest sound you can possibly, well, you couldn't imagine because it actually goes through the spectrum of sound into pressure. So it makes a complete sound curve, see? And, and you can feel it go through your head, literally, just moing. Uh, and after about, what, 12, 13 hours of that, we, we finally got, uh, the skipper said we're gonna try to surface, and we got the boat back up. We had enough high pressure air to get back up to about 100 feet. And uh, he started one of the engines while we were still totally submerged, which sucked a tremendous vacuum in the thing. There were guys who said it couldn't be done. It was done, because we had no other way to get back to the surface, and it drove us up to the surface. And, but just before we did that, he called us together and said we're gonna have a battle surface, and we're gonna go up there and die like Americans fighting. We're not gonna sit down here and die like a bunch of damn rats. And, and we hit the deck, and we were just waiting for the first shells to start hitting us, because we knew it was just a matter of minutes before they, they started pumping, the, you know, seven Jap 10 cans around you, you knew you were dead. And uh, we were breaking out our guns to do what we could. Our three, well, all we had was a three inch and some 20 millimeters, and I was only after 20 millimeter, and we were breaking out the guns to try to do what we could, as I said. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Johnny Haynes, who was our exec, uh, torpedo gunnery officer, and he said, uh, belay it, uh, stop everything, hold it, uh, stop. And we looked around, and there wasn't a damn Jap anywhere. Like a miracle. Frank Kay won the Navy Cross for his valiant efforts to save downed aviators. Our duty was still to rescue aviators, and we found out we had six of them downed off the island of Wake. And as we proceeded to one, we were, of course, closing the island where we were getting within range of their guns. And uh, this, uh, uh, the captain, uh, called uh, three of us up, myself as the officer in charge, and I had a gunner's mate by the name of Shelton, and a um, torpedo man by the name of Smith. <clears throat> and uh, our duty was to go up on the bow and get a life ring out, or ju just to recover the aviator, regardless of how. But the captain uh, submerged partly, and we had the um, uh, most of the hull submerged and just the bow and the conning tower sticking up. There was just the captain on the bridge, myself as the officer in charge and the two men up on the bow. And it, uh, just as we were approaching this aviator, the um, sh first shell hit off our port bow and as it went over you could just hear it whistling. I never heard one before and I didn't want to hear one again. But uh, the Japs had pretty much the range on us, and at that particular time, all of our planes that were flying over had gone back to the ship. So they had nothing to concentrate on but us. But we did uh, send a life ring out to this uh, aviator. His name was Harold Kicker. And uh, we did get him on board. And uh, as we did so, uh, uh, the captain, uh, uh, we were all getting ready to go below, and uh, as I started down the hatch, the captain called me up and he says, Frank, he says, I think you better stay up here and help me look. So as I, as I was on the port side of the bridge, he on the starboard, we were searching for any other aviators that might be in, within uh, our uh, vision, and uh, about that time, we just had shells just hitting all over, and how that man upstairs managed to keep one of them from hitting us, I'll never understand. But the old man realized at that time that we had better go below, which we did. But as a whole, we recovered uh, uh, six aviators. We found out that there was 10 of them that had been downed, and however, they could have perished in the crash landing or any other means but we did get six of them. And anyway, as a result, I was awarded the Navy Cross. Jess De Silva was the last man to leave the USS Tang and survive. This all started on the uh, fifth patrol of the Tang, and we were nearing the end of the patrol, and we'd already uh, used almost all our torpedoes. We just had two left. We'd just finished a successful attack on a convoy, and there were uh, ships that were sunk, and there were some that were damaged, and, uh, and uh, there was this damaged one, and we were on the surface, 
it was at night, about two o'clock in the morning, and uh, we decided to expel our last two fish and and uh, sink this crippled ship that was uh, that was setting out there. So uh, that's what we did. We lined up and came in very slow, and uh, we fired first the first fish and then, then the second one. And the first one went straight, but the second one started a, a, a circular run. And uh, it made a circular run and came back and uh, struck us in the stern. And uh, those that were on the bridge, of course, there's about 10 people up there, lookouts and uh, the captain and, and other people. Uh, when the ship was uh, hit, why, uh, you immediately started to sink, went down by the stern, and those people that were on the bridge that were able to, you know, float off and hang on to something, why, or stay afloat, uh, they did. And then, of course, the rest of us, I was down below, and uh, we went down with the boat, and it, it uh, went down in 180 feet of water. I was in the after engine room uh, just prior to this uh, firing in the last torpedo, and uh, uh, I moved forward to the uh, forward battery near the went in the mess room. I was going to get a cup of coffee. Well, I've been on the battle phones all this time. I'm, I deserve a break, so somebody else took over, and I went up. Well, I, I reached the uh, the uh, mess room, and I was standing uh, right by the door into where the sleeping quarters are in the after battery. And uh, there's a man there who was on battle phones, and he was telling us, you know, relaying the message what was going on. And uh, when he said, well, we've just fired number seven or whatever it was, and uh, you could feel the quiver of the, of, the, of the fish leaving, you know, and then pretty soon the second one, you know, and then we thought, oh, boy, we're all through now. We're going to head back home. And just about that time, pow, we got it. And it just felt like if you take, you know, if you took a fish by the tail and did this to it, well, that's just what it felt like. It just, you know, like this, a tremendous explosion, but still uh, the waving of the boat. And it was just so quick that we started down. We just almost immediately started settling down by the stern. And uh, so we ended up with uh, water flowing in through the conning tower, through this watertight door into the mess room. And uh, we knew that this had to be closed because all this water roaring in. See? So myself and a couple other guys, we went forward and we grabbed a hold of this watertight door and we managed to get it closed. And uh, then shortly after that is when uh, one of the gentlemen uh, flooded the forward tanks in the, in, the, in, the, in the forward part of the boat and we settled down on the bottom. We just sort of settled right on down. And at that particular time, those of us back there didn't know how deep we were or anything else. Um, so anyway, after a period of time, we figured we had to get out of there because of chlorine gas from the battery, the battery back in those compartments. So we just uh, decided, well, we either crack the hatch and, and, and see what happens. Maybe they got the, the, you know, the other hatches closed and everything will be all right. So we did. We cracked the hatch and the water came roaring in. Pretty soon it subsided to where it was only about knee deep and we said, okay, we can move forward. So we moved into the, into the control room and uh, we could see the gauges and everything, how deep we were. And, and, uh, and we still had some high pressure air in the air banks and we thought, well, maybe we can blow ourselves up. But uh, we tried using them, but you could hear air escaping, so we knew it was, you know, futile to do that. So uh, we, there was an officer with us, and uh, there was maybe uh, a dozen or so of us at that time, and uh, we just destroyed some things in the control room and that sort of thing. And then we looked in the, in the, uh, the hatchway that goes through into the next compartment, and well, there wasn't any water at all in there. So then we opened that hatch and we all started moving forward into the forward torpedo room because that's where you can make an escape. That's where there's an escape trunk and, and people can attempt escapes. So uh, we moved forward and uh, when we got to the watertight door, why, the ones that were already forward had moved forward to that compartment. So when we got into that compartment, there maybe was 35, 40 of us in there. And uh, by the time we, uh, you know, our little group had reached there, they had already attempted a, two or three escapes already. And uh, we still had lighting, uh, emergency lighting, but the air was foul, you know, it was pretty hard for breathing. We all had been issued these mumps and lungs that you strap on and that you use to breathe with when you go up in, in the escape trunk. So, uh, 
like I say, there had been a, a, a escapes made ahead of our group, and uh, there was one or two made while I was there, and then I had maneuvered myself over, over where the ladder was, you know, that you climb up in there, and there wasn't any panic, this sort of thing. There were injured people there, and they didn't want to try because they said that we, they didn't want to interfere with messing things up for other people if they did something wrong because of being injured. So they were content to, that was it, you know. So anyway, I was down right around the ladder and uh, two of the fellows climbed up inside and then they yelled down, we need someone else. And I was right there and I said, hell, I'm not afraid. So <laughs> I went, climbed up into the compartment and then we yelled down for one more person and uh, another one came up in there. So you can only get about four up in there at one time. And you close the lower hatch and you have a side door, you know, a side door, and then you have the hatch up above that leads out too. So this round compartment, when you get in there and seal it off, then you flood it with water and you flood it up to the side door, see, up to the top of the side door, then you can just open the door and you go out, right out into the, into the water. You're equalizing the pressure, see. Well, that's the trick of, of this whole thing is building that up and building the pressure up. And it was real tough taking that, that pressure at 180 feet. And, you know, you gotta build this water, you gotta flood this thing in, and you can't take a lot of time doing it. You gotta move right along. So anyway, we, uh, we managed to do that, and then uh, it, you, you were like breathing real, real fast, you know, just, just barely breathing. Of course, we had these mumps and lungs, so we had a, a line to, a, to the oxygen tank, and we took that line and we filled this, this mumps and lung with oxygen. Then you start breathing, breathing that. And uh, so this is what we did. And uh, then when everybody tested out their you know, lung, made sure everything was working. Why then, uh, one by one, we, we'd already had a line out, see, a line had already been let out. So then we just went out one by one, and I was the third man out, and uh, there was supposed to have been one more man in that, that was supposed to follow me, and, but he never did come up, and we don't know whatever happened to him. Uh, but the last man out is supposed to close the door, then they drain the water down below, see, and then the next group can come up. When I went in to make my escape, the lighting had gone out, the air was very smoky and foul. You were choking and hard time breathing. We were down to two battle lanterns, which not much light, you know, to see by. And so anyway, when I went out, I made it out real easy. I took my time going up, 10 feet at a time and stop and count to 10 and then 10 more. And pretty soon, why, I reached the surface. I had no ill effects or anything. And there were four other men up there when I got up. So that made five. So then there was five of us up there. So then uh, it had already, well, it was light by the time I got up. In fact, it, uh, when I went out of the escape trunk, I looked at the clock, and it was 8 o'clock in the morning. And all this action was started at about 2. And I thought to myself, what happened to all the time? You know, where did the time go to? Well, you know, you're, you don't think about time or where it goes when things are happening. You know, it just, it just happens. And because uh, people, you know, don't realize that uh, things can, can happen like that, you know. Time can just go by and, and you don't even know it. But anyway, we, I, when I reached the surface, it was light and you could see the ship's bow of the ship's we had sunk sticking out of the water. So uh, anyway, uh, there was five of us hanging on to this buoy. And uh, a short time later, two more men came up. One of them came right up where we were at and he was our uh, pharmacist mate, and he was coughing and bleeding and choking, and he had a problem. Evidently, he didn't do something right, you know, when he got out. He didn't follow procedure or something, but anyway, he did something wrong. And about 20 feet away, another person came up, uh, but he was floundering, and he didn't look like he didn't even have a Munson lung on. Well, he drowned. He just disappeared. And then, because the tide was drifting out towards the sea, and the tide just, all of a sudden, he was gone. And, but the other fellow, the, uh, we held on to him, and pretty soon, uh, oh, around 10 o'clock in the morning, I guess it was, uh, the Japanese uh, escort started circling around. We could see them circling around where the ships had been sunk. They were looking for survivors, too. Well, pretty soon, uh, they spotted us in the water. So we, and they came over pretty close, and they trained their guns down on us, and we thought, well, <laughs> they're, going to, <laughs> they're going to shoot us out of the water, you know. But they didn't. Uh, pretty soon they let down a small boat and they rowed over and they picked us up and they cut the line on the buoy 
And uh, then they took us over to the ship. And when they brought us on board, here was the four others that had escaped, you know, that had managed to stay afloat all night. So we, they put us all together and there was nine of us. And the pharmacist mate, they took him aside and we never saw him again. And we kind of feel that uh, they just threw him over the side. You know, he had gotten real bad. And uh, they weren't even going to deal with him, I guess, because we never did see him. Uh, so then that meant that there was just nine of us all together. And that's the way it was till the end of the war. They kept us together. We stayed together all through the war. And they took us to prison camp in Japan. And then that's where we stayed. Bob Link's family feared the worst had befallen him and his fellow crewmen. Early on, within a month or so of the beginning of the war, is either in late December or early January, we were going through a strait in the Philippines to head up north toward Japan, and a Japanese torpedo boat fired four torpedoes at us. I was on the bridge at the time, and the skipper was on the bridge, and at first he said there were moon wakes. A lot of you have been in tropical waters on a bright moonlight night, the swells will you see streaks on them, and they, 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 they look like moon wakes. But about the time he said that, they, two of them went right under us, one right under the conning tower, and I thought that was, this was it. But they were torpedoes, and this strait was narrow, and there were rocks on the other side of us, and they went off, all four of them. And we dove, we made a crash dive. We were just about at the end of the strait, so we made a crash dive immediately, and we went on out at silent running, and apparently this torpedo boat did not have sound equipment to, to follow us. And it so happened that a couple of days later, we went through a typhoon that we had a heck of a time with that came within an ace of sinking us, and it flooded our radio gear out. So we could not send, we could receive messages, but we couldn't send replies. And when the Navy ordered us to reply, we couldn't reply. So that went on uh, for I don't know how long, but my mother got a letter that the ship I was on was sunk and I was missing in action. And the Japanese reported they sunk a large underseas cruiser in the area that we were in, and the Navy knew that we were the only one there. And we, did, we, did, we didn't reply, they assumed that we had been sunk. And sh my family didn't know anything about it from that time, which was early January, until I walked in the house in June, July, 42. When my mother was putting a pan of biscuits in the oven, I, I hitchhiked cross country and walked from US 1. We lived about a half a mile from there on a farm. And I walked through the back roads home and walked in the back door. She was putting a pan of biscuits in the oven. She <laughs> almost fainted. My mother's pretty stout, though, and not, not stout big, but she's a tough person she was. And she survived all right, but it took me about 15 minutes to convince her that I wasn't a ghost coming home or something, or a mirage or something, but everything worked out real, real well. The Japanese had some surprises too. Walter Ryerson was introduced to a top secret weapon that thankfully never made it to the shores of America. The submarine was a different type of submarine that I ever was on. There was two pressure hulls, now mind you, on this submarine. And they had MAA, MAA diesel, German diesel engines. They had two in each compartment, side by side. And uh, then they had two on the other side. And this, this submarine is actually, was, carried three airplanes. And as we found out, you know, after we got aboard and everything, that they carried three airplanes. The purpose of the submarines was to bomb the Panama Canal, they had a range of 20,000 miles, which is almost around the world. It could fuel up to 20,000 miles. And what they were intended to do is to go, like you say, bomb the Panama Canal, then go up and take the Golden Gate Bridge out in Frisco. And from there, they were gonna go up into Oregon and into Washington and incendiary bomb the for forests up there and start the fires and then come on home. But we had sunk so many ships, our submarines had, and if we didn't get them, the Airedales got them one way or the other. They either coming or going, and they had to bring everything from the outer islands and the other places back into Japan. And so what they were used for was cargo carriers. With the war coming to a victorious close, the submariner could set his sights on home. He and his fellow sailors had accomplished more than any other single group in the military. The, the official statistics uh, 
although we had, they, they do say we had the highest mortality rate of any service in World War II, uh, and they, they estimate one out of four, something like that, when in fact, if you were to uh, take out the, the new submarines that were commissioned toward the end of the war that never made a war patrol, and the old submarines that, that uh, were used for school boats, of the 252 we, we had, technically speaking, we actually only had about 150, 160 submarines that carried the war, if you will. And of that, we lost 52. So our actual losses were closer to one-third, one out of three. The people that were involved in it, they were the cream of America crop. They were uh, the finest physical, uh, physically uh, uh, adapted people and mentally. And uh, they, and they had a tremendous attitude. And uh, to think that we have to go through actions where these particular men were lost, and uh, for many years the world didn't know what had happened or how it happened. And now in recent years we're able to tell the people what happened of these losses of these fine young men and the uh, contributions they made to our country to uh, keep it where it is with the democracy we have. And uh, it isn't perfect, but uh, there just ain't nothing better. And uh, uh, these people made contributions that uh, few ever get the chance to do. And this is why we uh, pay tribute to them. Uh, and I would feel grateful to think that if it happened to me, those people that would survive would have done the same thing. And you wonder why, why them and uh, not me. And uh, th th there is a reason when you go through 11 patrol runs and go through all the actions, uh, there is a little bit of a, a luck or God's guidance or whatever uh, the reason when you make it. You, you have a very uh, heartbreaking place in your heart and it never changes through your life for those people that uh, you lived with, you worked with, that never came back.